shout out that this event is just happening at People and Planet Organising. Um, normally I do these things because I have to, um, but this one's actually just going to be absolutely amazing. Um, it's on Monday at 6 o'clock in Ars Lecture Room 6. And basically they brought two people from an indigenous group in Canada who are being affected for, by like uh, sort of oil companies and their practices in a place called Tar Sands all the way to the UK just to speak to you guys. Um, it's genuinely going to be like one of the best, I think, ethical environmental events uh, of the year. Like, 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 like the House of Ladies Hand or whatever. Um, but as far as I'm aware, I think it's pretty much going to be it. Um, I think you guys should all go. Like it's, uh, it's in the Arts Building, Lecture 6. Uh, 6 p.m. on Monday. Uh, apart from this event, it's probably going to be one of the best events that you guys see. Yeah. So uh, be at it. I possibly put on. This house, this house believes this form of capitalism has failed and needs replacing. Sponsored by Alan the Lowry, and if anyone's interested, we do have promotion material at the church. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so, also, just before we start, I just want to say that Lauren, down here at the front, will be selling Israel Palestine tickets at £2 a ticket after this event. So, please do buy one from her, it's going to be a really good public debate. Um, question time event. Um, so, tonight, the speakers. On proposition, we have Dr. David Bailey and Leander Jones. And on opposition, we have Professor Colin Tain um, and Dr. Matt Zito. And the speech tonight will be seven minutes in length. Um, and then we're going to have some audience speeches, speaker and a bottle of wine, which will be fantastic. Um, and then we'll finish off and see who's won. Um, so before we do anything else, can we take a vote for the motion? So this house believes this form of capitalism has failed, needs replacing. Who wants to vote in proposition? Please raise your hands. You can come in, it's fine, if you want to. Yes, it is. And I have to say, when I start thinking about the title, This House Believes This Form of Capitalism Has Failed and Needs Replacing, I did start thinking, you know, well, with global, global capitalism essentially in collapse and in perpetual crisis, and one of its biggest crises at the moment, which part of capitalism would people actually try to argue that we actually wanted to try to keep? So presumably not the part which is systematically racist, you know, absolute poverty overwhelmingly affects the non-white sections of the global population, presumably not the part that's systematically sexist and that women make up 70% of the world's poor, earn an average 25% less than men and perform unpaid work that amounts to around half of global GDP. Presumably not the part that concentrates the majority of wealth in the hands of the world's top 5% and leaves the bottom 50% with under 2% of global wealth. Presumably not the part that channels over £15 million in pension payments to someone like Fred Goodwin for his role in breaking the global economy, or a salary of over £350,000 to vice chancellors for their role in designing education and pension policies, to screw students out of their right to education and lecturers out of their pensions. Presumably not the part that system simply doesn't work as it lurches from crisis to crisis to crisis, from the first Great Depression in the 1870s to the 1890s, the second Great Depression in the 1930s, the stagflation of the 1970s, the global recession of the early 1980s, the Latin American debt crisis of the mid-1980s, the global recession of the early 1990s, 
1997 Asian financial crisis, the bursting of the dot-com bubble in 2000, which was helped was only resolved by the loose monetary policy, ever-expanding debt and trade deficits in the US that allowed the subprime mortgage bubble to expand and then burst in such a spectacular fashion that we now witness a global economic crisis for which there appears to be no effective resolution. Presumably not the part that sees 20% of Britain's young adults currently in unemployment and a quarter of those who graduated four years ago still not having found full-time employment. And presumably not the part also where even if you do manage to find a job, and live a life of relative comfort and job security, you're still almost certainly li likely to live a working life of drudgery, subordination to an underqualified and overaggressive boss, boredom, and almost total absence of control over your working day, all of which is compensated for by one week on a beach per year, and every Friday night spent in the pub trying to drown out the experience. <laughs> all, of course, paid for on credit because the wages won't cover those things. So, presumably, it's not those things that we're trying to defend when we defend capitalism. So I guess the question then is, um, is it really capital? Well, I guess what is capitalism? And then is it really capitalism which caused those bad things that we talk about? And then I guess the real thing is, people are wondering, is there really a viable uh, alternative that would improve upon capitalism? So, in the um, probably three or four minutes I've got left, to define capitalism, and to say how it causes those bad things and how we can improve upon it. So basically, and it's all going to be very brief, obviously, capitalism, I'd say, is the concentration of wealth in the hands of a small elite, so we'll call them the capitalists. The rest of us have to basically force to work for wages. Money is the main way in which we uh, interact, both with the bosses and with each other. The capitalists' um, main aim is to pursue profit and therefore to compete to exploit us. So that means the bigger and better you are at exploitation, the bigger and better capitalist you will become. I don't know if anybody saw George Monbiot's piece in The Guardian earlier this week talking about Carlos Slim, the telecommunications magnet and richest person in the world with an accumulated wealth of $74 billion who has enough wealth to buy the labour of 440,000 of his Mexican compatriots for an entire year. So that is basically the definition of capitalism. The question I guess is how is capitalism responsible for those things? How does capitalism produce the racism, sexism, constant crisis, economic hardship, unemployment and drudgery for those of us lucky enough to live in a life of relative comfort? And basically the answer is capitalism doesn't work. Capitalism basically is the pursuit of profit, but profit as we've already talked about is the extra bit on top that we don't get paid for. So the problem is if we don't get paid for it then someone's got to buy it. So how, do we, how can we buy the bit that nobody's getting paid for? You basically, somebody has to borrow money to buy the extra bit to make the profit that the capitalists can then sell and then get the money, which is called the profit. So somebody needs to borrow, but the repayment of the debt itself requires there's got to be growth. You have to have growth to be able to get, earn the extra bit to pay back the bit that you borrowed. But then if you're talking about growth, you're talking about capitalist growth. So you're talking about capitalist growth trying to create, find new opportunities for profit making. But profit making requires borrowing, which requires debt, which requires growth, which requires further borrowing, debt growth. So basically the whole thing has to, has to by, in, it's ingrained in the system, has to grow. But in growing, obviously, it reproduces those same problems and the same tendencies for crisis and debt uh, uh, and exploitation perpetually. So it's a system that has to, by its nature, grow and has to, by its nature, seek further exploitation. So that explains, I think, things like colonialism and slavery in the early parts of capitalism, and also then its legacy, obviously, which is a racialized um, global political economy. But that explains things like, things like the undermining of workers and the strength of workers, things like the trivialization of women's work, both in the home and the trivialization of women's work in the workplace. It, invo it, it explains things like the constant need to divide labor up further and further and simplify jobs further and further so that we have a working life of drudgery. And it explains things, obviously, like the constant crisis. But it also explains, if we're, trying, if we're talking about a system that has constant need to grow and find new opportunities for exploitation, we're talking about growing exploitation which means extra inequality and extra poverty. So, I don't think that's very good. Um, <laughs> well, so what would an alternative to capitalism look like? One minute, okay. I think that's where we're on time then. So basically, there wouldn't be this ownership of wealth in the small hands of the, of the global elite, the capitalists. Decisions basically get made by negotiation, discussion, democratic, democratically deliberating and deciding, something we might call actual democracy, rather than the kind of democracy where you uh, elect a representative on something like tuition fees and then they do an absolute U-turn once they acquire power. There are plenty of examples of actual democracy. 
So you can go back to its power and history, things like Paris Commune the com in 1871, the Community Defence Committees in Barcelona in 1936, the Occupied Factory Movements in Argentina in the early 2000s. But I'd perhaps add a more, uh, a more kind of less exotic example, the university, where we have you know, a system of committees, apparently, Senate, Council, and then through down towards the department, which are supposed to run and organise our university. So it should, in principle, work. The problem with all of these examples is not that they didn't, fu that they didn't function, the problem is that they uh, get co-opted and I'll uh, get co basically get co-opted uh, and overrun and either, cr either crushed by the capitalists or steered by the capitalists in their own direction. So there is an alternative to capitalism, it's basically about trying to retake control of our lives and if you don't want to retake control of your lives then uh, shame on you but most importantly it's a shame for you. Uh, to open the case for the opposition. Okay, first of all, I, I want to pay a tribute to my colleague for an impassioned, eloquent, and long speech <laughs> for the proposition. I would expect nothing less from one of the foremost scholars of social democracy. Eloquence and passion do not mean sense or sensibility, though. In a moment, I'll set up my case more fully. At this point, I want to quickly deal with a couple of things that David has said. First of all, according to David, everything is the fault of capitalism. From the vice chancellor to the fact that people may have to work and not like their job. Um, David, secondly, would have been saying the same things in the 1840s, the 1890s, the 1920s, the 1940s and the 21st century. In other words, it's King Canute who wants to push back modernism, not capitalism. He's against the modern world, it appears to me. Because most of that litany of things that he talked about isn't about capitalism, it's about the modern world we live in. The second thing that he also uh, rather erroneously tries to persuade you about is that the mechanism by which capitalism works, the profit motive is terrible, um, the fact that it produces uh, inequalities, this is all terrible. Capitalism has a, a mechanism by which resources are uh, distributed, resources are allocated, that has not been better. So that's the two things he said about capitalism that's wrong. The, th the third thing he said wrong is, where's the alternative? The Paris Commune, David, for goodness sake, every single one of your cases ended in disaster. They couldn't survive, they had internal contradictions. So, but nevertheless, it was eloquent, it was well-meaning, uh, he did his best, and he had his nice things to say. So, um, my substantive points, and I'll try to keep on like him to seven minutes. Words matter. And the wording of this motion matters more than is usually the case in a debate like this. And it's a very important debate. <clears throat> this House is asked to support a vague notion of this form of capitalism. He hasn't told us what sort of capitalism. He's told us about he doesn't like the modern world. And he doesn't like the Vice Chancellor. <laughs> um, which form of capitalism? He doesn't even talk about the fact that there are many forms of capitalism. So even as a very clever academic, he's made a few slips of the tongue in order to make capitalism mean everything he wants it to mean. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you are being asked to make a leap in the dark for a replacement that has been untried and unthought through and is unworkable. And the list of examples gives you uh, reason to, to be concerned. And my opponent equates capitalism, when he does get round to it, with neoliberalism with financial crisis, and a very particular crisis we're going through now. But capitalism has faced many crises and survived. In an excellent book, uh, you know, I'm going to be academic here, uh, you might not want to not watch X Factor tomorrow night to read it, but it's very worth trying to if you, you can. Carmen Reinhardt and uh, uh, Kenneth Rogoff, this time is different, eight centuries of financial folly. They've actually done exactly what David did and talked about the number of times there have been financial crises of the type we're going through today. 
from, for the last eight centuries, but particularly from the 1800s. There have been sovereign debt crises, inflation crises, and employment crises. Capital limit is the most flexible form of economic structure which has survived these and has changed and evolved and developed. And as Western societies, we have survived many such crises, and this is no exception. David seems to be wedded to a 24-7 now assessment and a recency factor of what we're going through now as being the reason to get rid of something for a leap in the dark. Capitalism is flexible, adaptable, malleable, and it has dealt with these crises before. In fact, I bring in my aid a couple of quotes you know, from rabid capitalists. Capitalist, capital is money, is commodities, it brings forth a living offspring or lays golden eggs. Capital production develops technology and the coming together of various processes into a social value. Karl Marx, Das Kapital, Volume 1, Chapter 4, 1867. Or, everything is, is and is not. Everything is fluid, is constantly changing, constantly coming into being and passing away. Friedrich Engels, 1877. The biggest proponents of, uh, opponents of capitalism also said it had enormous potential to develop and to evolve and to create immeasurable amounts of productive capacity. Reject this notion, this motion, because it will reject 50 or 60 years of advancement for four reasons. It brought China into the world economic system in a potentially astounding uh, development for peace and stability in the long term dealing with the China problem and binding it into the international system and bringing nearly 300 million Chinese people out of poverty. <coughs> Secondly, it's created the most dynamic increase in world trade in our history, offering millions in Africa, Asia and Latin America, despite what David says, a route out of poverty and into democratic forms of governance. David didn't mention the fact that capitalism often produces liberty, <coughs> despite the things he's talking about, the structures that we, we have currently dealing with in the University of Birmingham. Fourth, thirdly, it's created a burst of technical innovation. Everything from solar panels, wind farms, to carbon capture, it potentially will help us round the biggest challenge we face, which is the environment. And fourthly, it offers an opportunity to deal with the growth of world population to 7 billion by giving people the means to produce material goods in flexible and adaptable ways. My final substantive point is, what do we replace it with? Social democracy failed in the 1970s with disastrous results. Stagflation, the, the collapse of social order. Keynesianism failed in the 1970s well, as well. Socialism or communism or the Paris Commune of 1870, um, every single experiment from the Soviet Union to Cuba has failed to deliver human well-being, the good life or social justice. You'd be buying a pig in a poke to replace this with David's strange new world. So, one minute summary, I haven't been given a bang notice for this stuff. Uh, I urge you, urge you to reject this notion, first because it's, it's based on a dangerous infatuation with immediate headlines, including those from the University of Birmingham, and it ignores huge strides of material progress that we've, we've made in the last 50 years. Secondly, reject it because it's a leap in the dark to a future economic and social system that hasn't been outlined by David. There's not a single argument that he's put forward as to how we would actually uh, manage this new system. <laughs> and thirdly, you should reject it because it's pessimistic and defeatist. We can cope with the current crisis and we can ensure that there's a spread of world wealth in a way that capitalism can do. Thank you very much. Continue the case for the proposition. Before I start, I'd just like to say how it's funny we're dressing to fit stereotypes here. The capitalists are all like business suits and jeans. Anyway, um, okay, it's going to be difficult to summarise my whole raise on Jets in seven minutes, but I'm going to give it a go. Capitalism is a blurry concept, and so in order to avoid confusion, I'm going to highlight some of the central elements of capitalism as they exist today, which I believe must be transcended if we're going to live in a just world. The first characteristic of modern capitalism is that it remunerates according to property rights. Let us imagine for a second, if we were to start from ground zero, how inequalities would arise in society. 
Firstly, you have differing levels of access to resources in different locales. This would definitely make a significant difference. On top of this, differing levels of access to information would make a difference. And genetic differences in human characteristics such as intelligence, strength or dexterity would likely have an impact also. But from a moral point of view, these differences are arbitrary and essentially down to luck. Only acts under our control and not owing to circumstance provide a moral justification for income differentials. And yet all of these things could lead me to acquiring more property than somebody else in a market exchange. And even slight inequalities in ownership of productive property will grow aggressively more unequal in economies where owners are paid for the contributions of their property. Having greater wealth will also confer advantages in terms of bargaining power, and so income differentials are widened further as the rich capture more of the benefits of every economic exchange. When the second generation in this hypothetical world come into being, the arbitrariness of income differentials becomes even more pronounced, as the children of the luckiest people in the first generation would also inherit their productive property on top of those other contingent assets available to them. Eventually we find a scenario where small initial arbitrary differences in circumstance have led to one of the most horrendous injustices imaginable, with a small group of people dominating the majority. So we have a situation where Bill Gates' wealth equals the combined wealth of the poorest 120 million Americans, or the poorest 45% of the population. Where the three richest people in the world have assets that exceed the GDP of the poorest 48 countries in the world. Where the world's 225 richest individuals have a combined wealth equal to the annual income of the poorest 47% 47 of the entire world's population. And yet 18 million people a year die of poverty-related causes. The second feature of modern capitalism is that its prices reflect uh, the costs and benefits to buyers and sellers, and the effects of any market transaction on third parties are largely ignored. But third parties are always affected. When you buy a car, the community is affected because there are more cars on the road. The taxpayer is affected because they have to pay for traffic lights and road repairs. The world is affected because of the extra pollution that results. The sheer number of economic transactions means that sufficient regulation to take these into account, these external effects, is logistically impossible. Seeing as those goods with negative external effects are underpriced with regards to their, so their true social costs, and those with the positive external benefits are overpriced with regards to their true social effects. Consumers' market preferences will always bend towards those goods with the greatest number of negative externalities, leading to a gross, systematic and ever-increasing misallocation of resources. This is the reason we use planes instead of trains. This is the reason we use oil instead of renewable energy. Thirdly, efficiency is only measured in a monetary sense and does not reflect reality in any way whatsoever. Something being cheaper does not necessarily reflect improved methods of production or technological advancement to produce more for less labour and resources. This is why we see Britain import annually 126 million litres of milk and simultaneously export 270 million litres of milk. Also, every year, 240,000 tonnes of pork is imported into the UK and 195,000 tonnes of pork is exported. As a result, energy use and transport emissions soar. Yet, for various reasons, these transactions reflect monetary efficiency, but obviously contravene any sort of common sense that could be provided by more coordinated economic activity. Fourthly, this leads me on to the element of capitalism which is perhaps most damaging, the negative implications of the system of competitive production and exchange. The system of competitive production in which one must compete or die leads to the unrelenting drive to cut costs and means that businesses time and time again engage in theft and fraud and contravene states' uh, regulatory standards including health and safety standards, environmental standards and workers' rights. The period of globalisation, with increasing capital mobility, is forcing developing countries to undermine their own regulatory standards uh, in a downward spiral in order to provide attractive conditions for foreign direct investment by cutting costs for international businesses. But these costs are being cut, that are being cut are really the safeguards of people's quality of life in developing countries. So the market forces well-meaning business owners to ignore external costs and to be socially irresponsible generally. This brings me on to the last characteristic of capitalism its propensity to create market monopolies. Ever-increasing inequalities of wealth alongside the pressures of competition and the advantages uh, to business, businesses' profit levels of this competition actually being eliminated lead to the establishment of monopolies as corporations naturally aim to seize as much power over society as possible. This shows a natural tendency towards economic planning as large corporations are essentially planned economies. These firms supplant the market for thousands of intermediate products 
They coordinate vast amounts of information and intricate flows of goods and materials. So it is untrue when we say that coordinating and planning economic activity does not work. It is in fact the free market which has never been proven to work, because it provides incentives for its own destruction. And the free market as theoretically conceived, in fact, does not exist and never has existed. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but large corporations are the wrong kind of planned economies. They do not serve the people's interests, but in fact exacerbate inequalities and disempower the majority. Of the 100 largest economies in the world, 51 are corporations, 49 are countries. The top 200 corporations' combined sales are 18 times the size of the combined annual income of the poorest 1.2 billion people on Earth. While the sales of the top 200 corporations are the equivalent of 27.5% of world economic activity, they employ only 0.78% of the world's workforce. So what have we learned today? That capitalism means reducing the majority of the world's population to a state of squalor, to a state of deprivation. That capitalism is the concentration of power in the hands of a few and the disempowerment of many. And that capitalism is a mass murderer. So when you defend this system, you have a lot to answer for. A common argument used to defend the system is simply there is no alternative, but I think this is insulting to the human race and ignores the fact that human ingenuity has driven societal progress throughout history. All we have to do is open our minds and be prepared to look for solutions. Although there is one fundamental principle that it must be central to any viable solution, and that is true democracy. If we had true democracy, we would not have environmental destruction, we would not have wars for resources, we would not have starvation. These things happen despite the fact that nobody wants them to. This is because capitalism creates a concentration of power which destroys the ability of people to influence social structures and subordinates people's interests to the dictates of the market. Democracy means the equalisation of power relations and this is what is key to justice. Thank you. Is to manifest their power and seize power through other, through other way. We look at USSR, people like Stalin. We look at, we look at communist China, people like Mao. They just manifest their power in other ways other than money. We don't think the exploitation of their people is any worse than the capitalist now, is any better than the capitalist we have nowadays. We think like those imperfections exist with or without capitalism. The current inequalities that we see, the current inequalities that we get so angry about, are all just manifestation of this human of this of this human imperfection through capitalism. So what we really need, ladies and gentlemen, what we really need to what we really need to make this world better, is this idea that we just need this continual human progression. So we think like all this narrative about occupying occupying Wall Street, occupying St. Paul's and like the student protests and all that are worthwhile in the sense that it makes us more aware of this human imperfection and we should try to correct it up and we should try to correct it. So is this, is this just a big pros prospect? Is just this an imagination that I'm trying to correct, that I'm trying to sell to you? No, right? Because human race has gotten better over, over the centuries. We come from human. We come from the, the uh, We come from origin of human being, where all you know of is self-preservation, and we progress onto a stage where we learn to live in community. We learn to have that tribal spirit that we care for the people who look like us and live around us. We then expanded that concept to like a, a bigger society or to a bigger society. We further expand that concept nowadays when we are able to empathize people halfway across the globe. When we are able to, when we recognize the concept such as racism and xenophobia are inherently unpalatable. But I think that human race have like do, have naturally gotten better over the years. And as long as this progression exists, we don't we think we think those those problem will uh, those problem that <coughs> proposition has identified will decline will decline a similar way will decline a similar way. So we say like capitalism can stay. As long as we make that as long as we, we, we recognize our imperfection and come to realization 
And because of the inequality of this world, because every places in this world are different as what the previous speaker have said, we can afford to pay a living wage to the workers in China, in Africa, and in all those developing parts of the world. We can afford to give them a living wage and remain competitive, and remain successful capitalists. Those are not mutually exclusive concepts. We can take care of people and make everybody better off and yet get rich at the same time. This is not an impossible panacea. What we stated in this debate today is that because capitalism is this immoral non-agent, which is essentially a machine, we cannot blame it for its failure. We can only blame the imperfection of human being. To say that capitalism has failed because some people exploit it is equivalent to us standing up here and saying the NHS has failed because some people manage to abuse the system, because some people go to accident emergency when they just have a cold and should just slip, slip it off. Like, we think, all, we think the fault of those matters lies within the human being, not with the system that is a non-agent. We need to identify where the flaw is. It's totally unfair to, sh to, uh, it's totally un unfair to say the blame doesn't lie in human imperfection and lies in this system which has no way of defending itself, which has no way to carry out its own agency. We back you to oppose. securitization and complex financial products that are completely unsustainable. Neoliberalism is a ridiculous system where we can afford holidays to Tenerife, where we can't afford our rent to live in. It's a ridiculous system where we can afford iPads, where we can't afford to feed our children. The outcome of neoliberalism is the ridiculous position of being in an under-consumption crisis. That's what we are currently in. That means a crisis where um, we, we can make enough stuff, but people don't have enough money to buy the stuff that we are actually making. This kind of crisis has happened before. An underconsumption crisis has happened before. It was not solved by capitalism. Capitalism consistently made it worse over 10 and 15 years, and that is what is going to happen under this economic system unless we change. In the 30s, the underconsumption crisis was, uh, was solved because Government on the back of huge protest movements went against the dictates of capitalism. They said that humans need to take control over the market instead of markets in over control of humans. They changed the form of capitalism and they asserted democratic control over the free market. That this form of capitalism has completely failed and we will not get out of this crisis unless we take the action just like they took in the 30s and we take back control of our system so that it works for people, work, uh, markets work for people instead of people working for markets. People will do lots of stuff in order to get money. I think like, that's probably proven by the fact that like every week millions and millions of people give one pound of their money on like a one in 40 million chance that they're going to win like seven million pounds. Like that's obviously proof that people will do completely stupid things to get lots of money. Because like you're obviously not going to win the lottery, but millions and millions of people want to win the lottery, millions and millions of people will try. Right? So like, the capitalist system essentially gives you like the ability to earn lots and lots of money, which I've just proven like people want. Like what it says like when you compare that to a system where like you don't necessarily like earn lots and lots of money by like working hard, like earn lots and lots of money by like doing stuff which like creates wealth or which generates wealth to society. Like it's extremely difficult to make people do stuff that's really important, like make people do stuff that's extremely beneficial, and, like make people do stuff that like you need for a societal economic system to work. Um, I think that's probably manifested itself when you look into like various different communist states, like, various different like states, like where um, like you've got this idea it's like it's not capitalist. Like the one that popped into my head is like Stalin world. 
Like, you've got, yeah, I call it Stalin world. Probably should call it Stalinist Russia, but Stalin world. Um, well, like, you've got all these people who are, like, getting roughly the same amount of money and, like, contributing. Like, what's happened is, like, oh, no, you can't get enough, like, we can't get people to work enough, so you're just going to have to go to, like, a mental amount of propaganda showing people to work. Like, if you're not this guy, this guy who we're going to call a hero, then, like, you're really bad. That still doesn't work. So we're going to do, we're going to kill you if you don't do it. Like, honestly, I'm going to purge you so hard. Like, the extent that people have to go in order to make people work when there isn't the incentive of becoming horribly rich is extremely difficult, and that's why I kind of buy into what Matt said. <laughs> Years of crisis, so 70% of the time we're in crisis. And crisis is not necessarily a bad thing. But the dot, dot, dot com bubble crisis left us five rocks. Like if you go even further back, if you look at the railway crisis you had in the 19th century in America, it left us with railroads and trucks. Now, the, I mean, yes, capitalism brought 300 million people out of poverty from China, but how many more people got into poverty after the recent financial crisis? <coughs> Many people lost their job in the UK and America. So you also have to remember this. You cannot only say capitalism to people out of poverty. So anyway, the fact that we do not have full capitalism is also true. We do not have free trade. Free trade doesn't really exist. We have regulation. We have rules all the time. And capitalism to its bare bone doesn't exist anywhere. As a matter of fact, every country which is confronted with free trade has more public spending than any other country. That's one fact. The other thing is that capitalism, like for example in the Austrian school of thought, is a cycle of creation and destruction. But if you look at the recent financial crisis, destruction is not allowed. We bail out banks that are going bankrupt. We don't allow them to be destroyed. So even capitalism we're proposing, the full bear capitalism doesn't exist. So what would be the alternative? Well, the communist lost. So this is a bad idea because we have negative image of Stalin, fair enough, this is one thing. But the true alternative, if you want to get rid of this inequality of wealth aggregation, then you have to reform actually the financial system before being either capitalism or communism. The interest rate within the economy, this will create eventually over a long time the, the aggregation of wealth towards the banks. Not so much because of capitalism, it's because of the monetary system. And yes, I mean, today I don't have an alternative. This is not the thing. But the truth is, some countries can afford capitalism. China, developing countries, some some countries like the old continent in Europe cannot afford capitalism anymore. We cannot survive a crisis. We do not have the growth to pay back the debt that we're using for bailouts. So we also have to keep this in mind. If today I don't come to it with an alternative of what can we have instead of capitalism, the question is not. Can we replace it? But when will we replace it? China doesn't need to do it today. Europe does. We don't have something proposed which is solid enough as well. Fair enough, because no other models were able to test themselves in reality. So it will take a lot of time. Democracy at the moment, if you look in Europe, even though you have a big financial crisis, democracy elections are going more towards a right-wing orientation than socialism. Yes, capitalism will have to be changed but in countries which actually need it. China doesn't need that, but the whole continent, whole continent needs it, and the question is just... So like 1997 in the UK was a far more socially equitable place, for example. That could be like, or, or say 1998 or 1999. That could be a way in which we could re-imagine, re-articulating capitalist structures to make them more socially equitable. Um, but even if it was the case that we simply have to go with capitalism in, in whatever form that the capitalist teleology drives us towards, I think that would be an incredibly crap world, precisely for the reason that Colin gives, because that would be, quote, uh, a leap in the dark. I don't want a structure where we solely follow some kind of profit motive, purely on the, on the reason that it's generally delivered okay results in the past. But I actually don't think that's like generally the case. But even if it was the case, don't, don't agree with that. But the major reason why I think that we need to have a serious rearticulation of the way in which capitalist structure works in the global economy is based on the fact of what neoliberalism does. It creates, an, it, it creates an incentive structure whereby foreign investors often get to dictate what domestic policies countries adopt. This is bad. 
It's bad precisely because of the fact that there exist massive social inequalities throughout like every nation in the world. And one of the ways in which we can combat this is by having is by merging the distinctions between public and private spheres. So a really great example of this is in the Danish as in the Scandinavian countries such as Denmark. Through their ability to have an autonomous, fis uh, autonomous fiscal kind of taxation policy and create social welfare systems that allow, say, women, for example, to become emancipated and allow for women to take time off work, all of those kinds of things, you can socially emancipate people and have a much better world. This can't happen under the current trajectory, or it's increasingly less likely to happen <coughs> under the current trajectory of capitalism because of the fact that it forces, uh, because of the fact that international investors are far less likely to invest in those kinds of countries because they generally don't yield as magnificent profits uh, as other countries may do. Nonetheless, they're still far nicer places to live. So it's just the case that like uh, global well-being isn't necessarily aligned exactly with the interests of capital. And as a consequence of that, we need to take serious measures in moving away from the current model that these guys kind of uh, accept and that wish to propagate, and more towards other socially equitable models. It would be an amazing coincidence if the profit motive of capitalism in this whole accidental system magically yielded perfect socially equitable results. If that situation isn't the case, and as a consequence, we need to take hold of it, we need to do it by following the motion and transcending this form of capitalism. Thanks. Quickly, cuts equality. I'd like to prove an, an idea to the contrary. Not too long ago, I was lucky enough to watch a programme a program made by Swedish journalist no, Johan Norberg, where he travelled to, to Taiwan where, and, and met three generations of a single family. The first generation had grown up in subsistence farming in what had then been one of the poorest countries in the world. That, that, the second generation, their children, had proceeded to work in factories in the, in the, in the growing state of Taiwan, which led to their, their, children, which led to their children, the third generation, to gain, um, to gain higher university level, level education and, and, a higher, and a higher job outside of a factory in what had then become one of the most dynamic and prosperous economies in the world. That is a success story I would like to present to oppose this motion and demonstrate a clear strength of capitalism and globalisation. I might contrast this to the view to the ideas of Marx, which, which his, his, his idea that one day we would have a class of society where all would own means of production, uh, which has, dare I point out, completely fails and not come true. And this is also in the case of, in 1989, when the Berlin Wall fell and, and the Soviet Union built around the ideology of communism fell. We now, even today, we still see, all, we still see North Korea in grinding poverty under communism. Now, I, may, may I use a simple acronym to, 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 to beg why the opposition should be opposed? TINA. There is no alternative. Thank you. Opposition speaker, but one, mentioned the example of the national lottery. Every week, thousands of people pay a pound to, for the negligible chance of winning millions. Capitalism is that system. It's a system in which we, um, as it's currently, as it's currently um, administered and to it, taken to its logical conclusion, we we devote we devote present resources in the in the slim hope that we will eventually become one of the lucky chosen few. Dr. Matt said that um, because of capitalism, we now live in a in a country where there's no one in real poverty. But that was not capitalism that um, gave us that. Capitalism gave us where we took us to where we were a hundred years ago, where the UK owned about a quarter of the world's land surface. But my ancestors were living in desperate poverty in Deptford. It was the post-war um, social democratic um, settlement that brought us to the situation where no one re no one lives in extreme poverty in the UK. Um, he also said that um, he also said that capitalism is a non-agent system. But then, why do we um, subordinate ourselves? Why do we give up our own collective agency to a system which has none? Although, as Leander says, there are agencies behind it. Why do we um, why do we subordinate ourselves to a um, to other people's agencies that are not honestly advertised up front? 
when we could have a system where we have real democratic control over our lives. Thank you. And if we didn't want this beauty, we wouldn't work for it. So, why, why not like, change the system? Why do we really work so hard in order to gather all these things and keep it in our treasure troves? Well, the alternative is that instead of working hard and making our own beauty and trading it for other people so we get what we want, we put it all into a big pile, and that pile is called communism. And let me tell you, that if a communist government comes along and says, put all this stuff into a wheelbarrow, shove it into our pile of communism, and take a fair share, none of us will work hard to get the beauty. And suddenly, we'll all run out of the beauty. The beauty is not just things like TVs and mobile phones, but it's, as we mentioned earlier, things like vaccines and fantastic research things that extend our lives and give us food and make our world a better place. And it's just as well we have our capitalist system because that way we have some booty to go around for everyone. But I've got a second confession, which is that I like giving other people booty. <laughs> 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 Christmas is coming along, and there's no better way of showing your affection for other people than like giving away some of the stuff that you own. And we do this every day, if we work, of course, excluding all the students here, through taxes and things like that. And actually, it's all about getting the correct balance between keeping our own beauty and giving away some to other people. And that way we'll have enough swag to go around. Thank you. I'd like to think of myself as one, and I've ever seen some of the most appalling caricatures of my ideology in my entire life. <laughs> That's not what we're going to go into currently, but if you do want to talk to me about communism, you're more than welcome to come and talk to me afterwards, and I will show you why you're all being terribly silly in caricaturing it like a big, uh, a big pile of booty, I believe. <laughs> I'm pretty sure there was more to marks than that. Anyway, we'll get into what I've been hearing quite, quite often uh, within this debate, is that we're kind of accepting blindly this narrative of capitalism versus communism and that capitalism triumphed over communism. The biggest opposition in the world in world history, the biggest event, the Cold War, that ended with the triumph of our liberal capital model. I ask you to go uh, to we'll go back in history to the 1940s. We'll go back in, in the 1950s and 60s to countries in the third world, the developing world, whatever you want to call it. And you'll ask them whether it was against the East or the West. Now we talk about the uh, horrors of communism. Yes, communism, Stalinist uh, bureaucracy, was an awful thing that happened. But do we ever talk in these narratives about the horrors of imperialism that were going on at the very same time as our, as our grand narrative of the Cold War, or just prior to it? I'll refer you to the, Indian, uh, the, the country of India when we, uh, as Britain, colonised that country and oppressed it massively for the purposes of profit appropriation. These are things that Lenin talks about. Uh, Lenin's not very nice, but he talks about the way in which capitalism must overcome its, its, its barriers to growth. And that is what imperialism is. We talk about the violence of communism, but we never talk about the violence of capitalism that happens every single day. There is a war in Iraq with thousands and thousands of people killed for reasons that are incredibly dubious and perhaps attributable to capital appropriation, to profit appropriation. I'll tell you that. And I also say Afghanistan, more wars. We see drug wars in Mexico for the incentive of money, the great money that buys us lots of things. People kill each other for money. They kill them each other every day for money. They rob each other on the street for money because people do not have enough money. And why do people not have enough money? It's because there is a system that denies them the chance for equality. It denies them their chance to fulfill their potential as a human being through the profit motive, through the profit incentive, through capitalism. Now, that's, uh, that's the scratching the surface, I've got some other things. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, 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 no. We have uh, the, the money incentive, the incentive to grow. How do we explain our political apathy? We buy and we buy and we never stop it, but we don't seem to care about where our democracy is going. And I would say that the consumption, the act of consumption, 
has been turned into our ideological. This is what we are about, is consumption. We are defined by the products we consume. We are no longer defined by empathy, by democracy, <coughs> by freedom, for solidarity. These are all things that have been crushed by money, the profit incentive, and mobile phones. I would much rather have an active democracy, I would much rather have equality, than a bloody iPhone. Because, <laughs> just think about it for a minute. And one more thing before I finish. When you say that communism does not work, yes, we all know that. Capitalism also does not work. Go to anywhere south of the border, down past the equator, and go and say, well, you know, I've got an iPhone, I've got Christmas, it's bloody brilliant. And what have you got? I've got fucking nothing, thank you very much, because you've got everything. That's capitalism, it works great, it works a treat. I say think about that before you vote against this motion. Thank you very much. They didn't say that. They threw everything into the pot to try to argue that basically modern life is crap. Let's get, let's find a different planet. And I think we got a lot of that from some of the comments uh, in, in support of the proposition, but not everybody. A lot of people who made arguments in support, uh, Bryn, for example, made f uh, a fine point. It's about a dialogue about different ways of running our society. That doesn't preclude a capitalist mode of production, it means controlling that capitalist mode of production. And if that's the sort of debate we want to have, that's a different proposition. And I would be in there with you, because I think there are other forms of control that we need to, to discuss. But that's not what we're being asked today to vote in favour of. And that's what we have to remember. Um, very good point about environmental degradation. Absolutely, this is what our planet needs to be dealing with. But the point we were trying to make was, some forms of capitalist incentives can help us solve that. Not that capitalism is the only way of solving it, or that capitalism hasn't been a contributor like the rest of us have been since Roman times, actually, in making the carbon emissions that we're now suffering from. And a lot of the tenets that people have been coming across tonight has really been antagonistic towards modernism, towards modern life. Not about capitalism per se. And this debate is about capitalism. And as my, my friend Matt said, capitalism is more a set of tools than it is this everything in the world is wrong. And I'm afraid if you're going to buy the arguments as presented rather than presented by the people in the audience, if the audience, Darcy and, and, uh, and uh, Kelly and Simon and so on had actually been in here, maybe we would have a different vote, but unfortunately you've got these two, who, who, who basically, want to, basically want to tell us that everything that is wrong with modern life can be held, the thing that can be held accountable for that is a form of capitalism, and it's a parody of capitalism. In fact, I wonder whether David wouldn't be saying the very same things that he said in his speech in a sort of King Canute-like way if he'd been in the Paris Commune or if he'd been in the, uh, uh, the fall of the Bastille. In fact, basically, everything that's happening in modern times is crap. Can I please get off and start again? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so I didn't make an argument for social democracy. I mean, basically, because I don't, social democracy is a part of capitalism. That's the whole point. Social democracy doesn't work either. And you say, oh, you say, oh, we should go back to some kind of social democratic compromise as the resolution to you know, reforming neoliberal capitalism, and wouldn't that be nice? But obviously, we have to have some kind of understanding historically. Why did social, Demo why did social democratic compromise of the 20 years that it managed to survive for? Why did it collapse and then get replaced by neoliberalism? So, social democracy doesn't work. And it, what, tell, it really infuriated me was when the um, when like the housing bubble burst and all this thing and, all that, and, and the financial markets went into collapse and everyone said well we should have been we should have been regulating the financial markets but that was the entire point that if you'd have regulated the financial markets capitalism wouldn't have been able to tolerate that regulation we would have had a slump and they would have and then we would have had massive lobbying for um, liberalisation so. Basically, you lose if you choose social democracy, and you lose if you choose neoliberalism, which is why I didn't make the argument for social democracy, because I'm not a social democrat. Maybe, the, maybe I should have done it, stuck to the wordings. But, um, so then the argument, you know, I'm just against all things in modern life. Well, I mean, I don't think that's really fair. I mean, I'm arguing quite clearly that I'm not against all things in modern life. I'm against 
the capitalists at the top imposing their control over our lives. So there's things I like about modern life, you know, which is people standing on the bridge over the Aston Web saying, this is great, we're going to actually resist and fight and we're not going to take this shit. I like that. So there's parts of modern life that I think are absolutely like, amazing. Um, like, the capitalists made the iPods, therefore we should love capitalists. It's just, it just doesn't make any sense. Of course, the people in China are getting paid pennies and then uh, committing suicide because of the level of work they're being exposed to. They're the people who made the iPods. So they're the people that we like, <laughs> that we should thank for it, not somehow, I don't know, bloody Jobs, where his name is, <laughs> because he happened to like, sit and get hostily rich. It just doesn't make any sense, basically, as far as I can tell. So that's my sort of response. Um, uh, capitalism motivates, well, I mean, what, yeah, so, what, so one of the, oh, sorry, there's loads, basically there's so, so much that I could like, spend an hour trying to respond to everything, but I did want to go back to the Japan thing, you know, Japan 50 years ago was recovering from being uh, virtually annihilated from a rising capitalist power, so obviously life didn't look very nice then, people were basically dying of cancer uh, because they'd uh, been, been bombed by a nuclear bomb, so I don't necessarily think you can support, praise capitalism for then allowing Japan to resurrect itself, having been bombed, virtually bombed into annihilation. Um, okay, um, it's not agentless, obviously, the capitalists are doing it and we're trying to stop them doing it. Um, uh, I th yeah, so I think the main point is, what am I actually advocating? No, this, is, sorry, this is the main criticism most people got, there's no alternative. So therefore we give up, we just accept this dystopian thing where, where a few people get colossally rich and the rest of us live a crap life. I, mean, I don't personally think people at 18, 19, 20 should have given up that much at this stage that they would actually accept that argument. No, we can do better. We should be trying to do better. And actually, if you do like, give up that dystopian, there's no alternative, life's crap, let's just get on with it thing, life becomes a lot better because you start actually think of finding ways to, what, to find alternatives to it, to resist it and to improve your own life with other people that want to do the same thing. Therefore, I think we should vote in support of getting rid of capitalism. Thank <laughs> you. 